Hello, I'm Will Hickox of the Watkins Museum of History. Welcome to John Brown Speaks, a Stuck at Home event. This is the premiere of a new series in which historical figures from the border region will speak to us about their lives. This is a Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area program in partnership with the Watkins Museum of History. Today, in 2020, we face a major health crisis. Americans 164 years ago also faced a major crisis, uh, this one about slavery. Should it be allowed to continue, and should the newly opening Western territories be free or slave? Uh, in Kansas and Nebraska had what was called popular sovereignty. They would vote on whether to allow slavery. Pro and anti-slavery forces poured over the Kansas and Missouri border uh, to influence the vote sparking a bitter guerrilla conflict called Bleeding Kansas. Now, through a marvel of technology, uh, we are able to speak with the famous leader of abolitionist fighters, John Brown, in the year 1856. And you all have an opportunity to pose questions to Mr. Brown by typing them in the Q&A feature on your screen. If you see a question you like, give it a thumbs up to advance it in line. Now, we may not be able to answer or to address all of your questions, but we appreciate your involvement. If you enjoy this event, we encourage you to help us uh, present more such programs by making a donation through the link, which will be provided in an email you'll receive after this event. And now, John Brown speaks. Good morning. My name is John Brown. You may have heard of me. You may not have heard of me. You may have an opinion of me. None of that makes any difference. It could not matter less. But what does matter 
What does matter is that you know the truth. It is written in scripture that the truth shall set you free. And I, I believe in freedom and I believe in setting people free. So I will tell you a little bit today of me and my story and what happened in Kansas and, and let you as sensible people make up your own minds about who I might have been or who I am today. I was born May 9th in 1800 in Torrington, Connecticut. My family were abolitionists. My father and my mother, before, I, before she died when I was eight, they taught us the evils of slavery. I saw slavery's evils firsthand when I was 12, when a, a young slave boy that I had befriended was beaten with a metal coal shovel by his master, beaten bloody right in front of me. I still, the thought of that still enrages me. I couldn't do anything at the time, but I knew I could do much when I grew up, which I did. I have a family. My first wife, she died and I married Mary. Times passed and slavery, slavery did not get weaker in this country. You see, abolitionists said, oh, slavery, the way to end slavery is to talk about it is to tell people over and over again how bad slavery is and that eventually they will understand and, and end it. But that's not what was happening. Not what's happening at all. Slavery continued to get stronger in this country. And more and more, more and more and more and more of our black brothers and sisters were put into bondage. The only reason they were in that bondage was the color of their skin. Some people said it, it was good for those black folks to be slaves. It improved their lives. I never saw one white person line up to be put into slavery to improve their life, not one. As I said, time passed and slavery, slavery strengthened Every act that came out of Congress seemed to make it even more stronger. 1850, the Compromise of 1850 made, made it so terrible in this country for escaped slaves. The Fugitive Slave Act made it a crime for anybody to help a slave escape or help them on their way. It continued to get bad. And then came 1854 and the Kansas-Nebraska Act and that changed all the rules. It would allow Kansas to be a slave state by a vote and people from both sides of the issue poured into Kansas, pro-slavers and free staters. Many of those free staters didn't care one way or the other about slavery. They just wanted Kansas to be a free state so they could have a job here. They wouldn't have any competition. Well. Others were abolitionists. And five of those young abolitionists who came out to Kansas were my sons. They came in 1855. They weren't here very long before trouble brewed. Well, trouble had been brewing since 1854. Violence, bloodshed, so much violence and bloodshed that it was becoming known as Bleeding Kansas. And early on, most of that blood was free state men's blood, unfortunately. Well, they got out here and they let everybody know that they were abolitionists and not the kind of abolitionists like many were that didn't like black folks at all, but wanted to end slavery and get them out of this country, send them back to Africa. They said, we are the kind of abolitionists like our father, who believe that all men and all women are brothers and sisters and that once our black brothers and sisters are freed from their bondage, they will join us in this nation as full citizens and we will work alongside each other and live alongside each other and our children will go to school together as the equals that we all are. Well, that wasn't a particularly popular idea at the time. So they had a lot of trouble, even in Kansas. It was also a bad year for crops, a drought, and they all got the ague. So they wrote back to me where I was living in New York and, and said, Father, can you please come to Kansas? This is where the decision over slavery will be made. And, and please bring weapons because 
Many of the free state people came out here expecting it to be a free and open election and did not bring weapons with them, but the pro slavers sure have. They're armed to the teeth. So I came to Kansas. I hadn't been here very long before the violence increased. The Wakarusa War, when Lawrence almost was attacked, Lawrence, the headquarters of the Free State Movement. It wasn't because Lawrence fortified itself, but that was short-lived because now we've moved into 1856. This year started off with bloodshed and it has continued. That bloodshed, well, Violence is sometimes necessary. People say, are you a violent man? I'm saying, no, I am not a violent man. But certain times require certain actions. And those actions cannot always be peaceful. Not always be peaceful. So what happened in eight, what, you, may, you may not know what happened earlier this year, but so I'll give you a little, a little background In May, Lawrence was again marched upon by pro-slavery men. And this time they weren't ready. The town was sacked and burned, burned to the ground. They hoped to get rid of Lawrence, but Lawrence is coming back. It takes more than that to get rid of Lawrence, but other things happened. Other things were happening at that same time. Jefferson Buford, a pro-slavery man, had 300-man army roaming the territory. I did some intelligence work and found out that he intended to sweep the Potawatomi clean of free staters and then go on to the rest of the territory. A massacre was brewing and it was very obvious who was the intended victims. My intelligence work also showed me that a group of men living along Potawatomi Creek intended to kill my family and I. Something had to be done. Pro-slavery men were roaming the countryside, killing free state men, and the government, who was pro-slavery, did nothing about it. Nothing! We had two choices. We could leave Kansas to become a slave state, where thousands more of our black brothers and sisters would be put in bondage or we could stay and we could fight. We chose to stay and fight. On the night of the 24th, 25th of May, five of those pro-slavery men who had threatened my family, who intended bad things for my family, were pulled out of their beds along Pottawatomie Creek and hacked to death with broadswords in what's people being now calling the Pottawatomie Massacre. I have been associated with that, but I have never admitted and I have never denied that I was there and I shall not do that today. But I will tell you, something had to be done to show those pro-slavery men, all of them, that they could not kill and burn with impunity, that actions had consequences and that those actions would result in severe consequences. consequences. So, Something needed to be done, and something was done. One of the results of Potawatomi is that a young Virginian named Henry Clay Pate started looking for me to arrest me. He was, a, a, got a, he was appointed a deputy U.S. Marshal. I heard he was after me. I heard that he had captured two of my sons, so I wanted to stop him. So. We found out that he was camped along Blackjack Springs Campground, about 17 miles southeast of, of Lawrence. We attacked at first light on June 2nd, and we defeated him. We defeated him in what's now being called the Battle of Blackjack. It was the first regular battle between free state and pro-slavery forces in Kansas, or really anywhere that I know of. People began saying, civil war has broken out in Kansas. And it was civil war. There was a price put on my head. 
I wasn't sure what I could do to get it off my head, except be careful. I uh, had an idea. I have an idea. And uh, I won't go into exactly what I'm going thinking about doing because I never know who's listening to what I'm saying unless I'm in a small room with, with friends. But uh, I'm going to take Henry Clay Pate's Bowie knife, the one I took from him at Blackjack when he surrendered to me, take it to a blacksmith somewhere, somewhere back east, and have him make a thousand copies of it. And you may wonder what I'm going to do with a thousand copies of that. Well, I'm going to put them on the end of six foot poles to form pipes. I don't, I'm not gonna say what I'm going to do with those pikes. However, if you're a good free state person, get in touch with me. I will see if I can trust you. And if I can trust you, you can join my band and, and we, will, uh, we will free the slaves in this country. Abolitionists, all that talk, all that talk does nothing. Talk, talk, talk. No one was ever freed from slavery by people talking about how bad slavery was. The only way slaves can ever be free, like in Haiti, is to take it into their own hands and free themselves. And that takes action. Action! Action is the only thing that we can do to end this evil. The government will do nothing. The government is pro-slavery. They're afraid the states that have slavery will secede from the union if they don't get everything they want. Well, we have to change that. We have to do something. We have to end slavery. It is a blight on this country. The United States could become the greatest nation on earth, but the Lord will never allow it to be as long as it has the yoke of slavery around its neck. Slavery is an abomination. It is the sum of all villainies. How can, how can you justify slavery? We are all brothers and sisters under the Lord. So how can you justify owning a brother or a sister? I do not understand it. I, I cannot ever understand it. I cannot see the other side's point of view because it's wrong. It's wrong. People say, you hate slavers. No, I do not hate anyone. We are all children under God and all brothers and sisters. I do not hate the sin, sinner. I hate the sin. But when that sin becomes manifest in people's actions, something has to be done. Slavery is a war waged by the slave, own, slave owner against the slave. And that war has been going on for 250 years since that first black man was put into slavery. Millions have suffered. Everyone supporting slavery is a warrior in that war and can expect the consequences that come from being a warrior. No, I don't hate. I don't hate the people I am against. If they would suddenly see the light, they could join me as equal brothers and I would be joyous about them, but no, hate the sin. But when the sin becomes manifest, fight the sin and the sinners. I have many other tales to tell, but I won't tell them all today. See if there's anything else I need to tell you about Kansas this, in this year. Of course, it's been a violent year. The Battle of Blackjack, Battle of, two battles of Franklin, Battle of Fort Saunders, and then the Battle of Osawatomie, where Frederick, my, my son, was gunned down before the battle. He was unarmed gunned down by Martin White. 
a religious man, supposedly. He was a preacher and the most racist man anyone had ever met. People said, are you going to take justice on him? Take revenge? I even had the opportunity. We were in, in Missouri riding through the, the territory there and we, we came across Martin White. My, my men wanted to go kill him, but I said, no. I said, no, this is not about revenge. What we do, we do for a principle, and that principle is the restoration of human rights. And I left Martin White alone to live out his life, hopefully someday repent for what he had done. But I did not take revenge on Martin White because revenge is not mine. Revenge is only the Lord's work. Well, I've talked enough now. I will uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, I hope we can meet again someday. Absolutely. Mr. Brown, uh, thank you for that powerful introduction and uh, narrative of your activities this year, this very pivotal year of 1856. Now, questions are starting to roll in, and uh, a lot of people are interested to hear more about your family. We have a question from Claudette, and she wants to know, uh, can you tell us more about your wife? Did she support your cause? Well, I actually had two wives. Diantha was my first wife. We married in 1820, and she unfortunately died in 1832, immediately following the stillborn birth of our seventh child. But the Lord brought me Mary, Mary Day, and she uh, became a very good stepmother and uh, for Diantha's children, and of course we had children of our own. I fathered 20 children, but many of them have not survived. It is a hard life, there is accident, there is illness. It is a hard life. Yes, Mary supported me. The entire family supported me. One day, we all got together in the parlor and we sat down and we swore an oath, all of us, to work our entire lives against the evil of slavery until either slavery ended or our lives ended. So yes, my family, my family supports me. Unfortunately, she's back in New York with our small children. And, uh, well, I hope to see her again relatively soon. The sooner we get this over, the sooner slavery ends, the sooner I can get back to my peaceful life and uh, be a wolf, take care of my sheep and sell my wool. All right. Now we have another question here that's very interesting. Uh, Claire Stafford would like to know, during these territorial times, uh, are there many um, African Americans living in Kansas? And uh, are we seeing uh, underground railroad activity in this region? There are not a tremendous amount of my black brothers and sisters in here. Unfortunately, there are some that are enslaved. These pro-slavers bring their their chattel with them and make them do all the work as they usually do. They, uh, they take it easy while my black brothers and sisters work their, work their lives away. Underground Railroad? Oh yes, there's Underground Railroad. There is Underground Railroad. Lawrence is a major point on the Underground Railroad. There are a number of abolitionists in Lawrence who are working on the Underground Railroad as station masters, conductors, depot masters. However, I, I, I can't tell you specifics because that would, uh, that would endanger them because they are breaking federal law. I mentioned the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. It said that anyone, anyone who assisted an escaped slave in any way, as simple as giving them a drink of water, they would be subject to arrest and imprisonment in a federal penitentiary at hard labor for up to six months and a thousand dollar fine for each 
escaped slave they were caught with. Imagine what that would mean if you were a station master on the Underground Railroad and you were apprehended with three of my black brothers and sisters escaping to freedom in their barn. You can calculate what they were risking, but they were brave and they would do it. And there are people around Lawrence who are doing this and other places in Kansas. Quindaro, well, Quindaro is a hotbed of abolitionism, but I won't tell you names. That's for the history books who will eventually write, be written about this period. All right, so let's get another question here. We have a lot of questions rolling in and they're wonderful. Uh, here's a good one. How did you get, how are you getting support and resources for your uh, abolitionist movement? And uh, do you get the support locally or from organizations back east? Of course I do get some support here, actual support from people here, physical support, being my, my men, and some money, but not much from here. No, I have supporters back east. Uh, I have made lecture tours. I intend to do other lecture tours in the future to, uh, to raise money, to spread the word about what's happening here in Kansas. But uh, I have a group of men, wealthy men, abolitionists all, who understand the importance of ending slavery and who understand that slaves are not some strange group of human beings, but they are our black brothers and sisters. So they are putting their, their fortunes in behind me. I, of course, can't tell you who they are. But uh, yes, I have support. I have monetary support. I have moral support. And out here in Kansas, I have physical support. Interesting. Let's get another question here. Uh, so here's a question again about uh, your local activities. Uh, how many uh, men fought with you, or I should say how many people fought with you at the Battle of Blackjack, which you described earlier, and uh, were any of them from Lawrence? I had around 20, between 20 and 25. Uh, I, I, I lost track of a couple of them because we started off with a group of men that were actually following me but as the battle progressed, uh, we got some uh, reinforcements coming in. Uh, and I never did get all of their names and uh, where they were from. They showed up and then they, they vanished before, before we were done because they were not part of my group. Um, yes, several from Lawrence. Um, once again, I don't, I'm not going to tell you their names because you never know who's, who's watching. And, and I will tell you, how dangerous it was to be a member of my group. Jacob Cantrell, free state man from Missouri. He was at blackjack with me. However, many of Pate's men were his neighbors in Missouri and they saw him there and they started screaming at him, calling him a traitor. They said, we're going to get you Cantrell, just wait. After the battle, we took Pate and the rest of his men prisoners and we, we took them down to land that my friend Tory Jones owned along Middle Creek to uh, wait out what he, Pate, Pate said he could get my sons back from where they had been taken to uh, custody by the military. He said, I can get them back, get them free in exchange for me and my, my lieutenant. I said, of course. So we were waiting for that. But on the 5th of, uh, 5th of June, we were surrounded by a group of dragoons under the command of Colonel Edwin Sumner, assisted by a young lieutenant uh, named Jeb Stewart, who forced us to release the men, which we did. Peyton and his men went back up to Prairie City and then went back. We're going back east along the, the Santa Fe Trail, the Santa Fe Road. Jacob, lived in Prairie City, and he had not gone with us down to Middle Creek. He had gone home to take care of his family. And, and Peyton and his men got to Prairie City. They found Jacob and they, they grabbed him and bound him and drug him along with them back into Johnson County. 
They set him down. They had a drumhead trial. They found him guilty of treason against Missouri. They stood him up against a tree and gunned him down for helping out John Brown. Well, that's why I won't tell you people's names. It's too dangerous. There are men out there who you don't know, don't know their loyalties. So you have to be very circumspect with who you talk about important matters. Well, Mr. Brown, uh, I certainly understand, and I think the audience does, your uh, desire to be circumspect, as you say. But uh, digging a little deeper into your activities here in Kansas and elsewhere, uh, folks are interested to know, uh, well, maybe I'll preface this question by saying that in the 21st century, we have access to technologies which you don't. And people are interested to know uh, how you traveled back and forth from Kansas from the East Coast to Kansas and back. Uh, what were your methods of travel? Uh, how long did it take? Were there any um, dangers, discomforts along the way? Well, when I came out here to Kansas originally, I needed to stop in Ohio uh, to acquire weapons. Uh, but the method to, to move is you, you take, the, take the railroad from one point to another until the railroad ends. And then if you're fortunate enough to be along a river that has uh, navigated and it can be navigated, take steamboat. That's what we did coming out here. Uh, that was dangerous though, because going through Missouri, the pro-slavers were very, very aware that there were free staters coming through Missouri and they did everything they can to stop them. Uh, you had to pretend like you weren't a free stater. We stopped one time, the, the riverboat stopped on the Missouri. We got out and I did a very, had to do a very sad family, uh, family business. Uh, you see, when my sons had come out here earlier, they brought their families with them and one of my grandsons had died on the trip and had been buried in Missouri. And I, uh, I collected his body to bring with me into Kansas and bury at the family, bury him at the family uh, compound. Uh, after we got off the steamboat, we get a wagon or a horse. Of course, I had to have a wagon to haul all the supplies. How do I move? How did I move? How do I move? Well, I ride horses or I walk. Here in Kansas, there are no railroads and the steamboats ply the rivers, but not where I'm going. So you do a, you do a lot of walking and a lot of riding. It doesn't take as long as you might think it would. You can move fairly rapidly on a horse. The whole time it took me to come out to Kansas, the entire trip was several weeks. It doesn't take as long as some people think it does. Mm. And of course, I moved all over Kansas while I was out here. It's necessary necessary to to move as fast as you can because situations require that sometimes that's interesting um digging uh again a little bit deeper into your travel in this area uh, people would like to know where you stayed when you were in lawrence well it was the hotel of course and then there were mm -hmm. friends houses um, many of the people, as I mentioned before, on the Underground Railroad, they, they would put me up uh, anywhere I could find a bed. After Pottawatomie and before Blackjack, we slept rough out on the prairie. Uh, when someone's after you, you have to be careful and uh, stay away from towns as much as you can. Friends, acquaintances, supporters, wherever they are, you can usually find refuge. But not stay in one place too long. When I first got out to Kansas, no one had heard of John Brown, but when I left, I was notorious. So I had to be much more careful the longer I was out here. 
My picture, of course, did not appear in the papers. Uh, so most people didn't really know what I looked like except the description. But my, uh, my, the, the, what people knew of me went before me in many cases. Interesting. People are very interested in the geography of your operations. We have a question here from Marilyn Black. Could you elaborate on how your residency in Crawford County, Pennsylvania may have influenced your lifelong commitment? Uh, apparently you uh, were quite active in that area. Oh yes, yes. I've been active in many places. I, when I saw my 12 year old friend beaten with the metal coal shovel, at that moment I swore to myself to work the rest of my life to end slavery. So every action that I took after that, I had in the back of my mind how that could, how that could be put to use, how I could use that, what I would need to do to end slavery. All of my actions had freeing my black brothers and sisters as the goal. So everywhere I went, I participated in the local activities. I participated in the Underground Railroad. Because you see, back then, I did not realize that what abolitionists wanted to do was not going to work. Uh, that took a time, took time to understand that. I, I, I believe that maybe what Garrison said was moral suasion would, 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 would change people. But the more I saw, the stronger slavery got, well, the more I realized that wasn't going to, to happen. And that was a slow process, but it was a sure process. So every place I lived, something happened that made it a little more obvious to me that slavery was not going to go away on its own until I got to Kansas. And I guess people could say I was radicalized out here, but then many people were. Kansas was not a safe place. If you came to Kansas neutral, you couldn't stay neutral and survive. Yes, Pennsylvania was very crucial in my, in my life, as was Ohio, as was everywhere that I, I went and learned, learned the evils of slavery firsthand. Mr. Brown, uh, we need to wrap things up soon, but there's a very important question here, which I think uh, needs to be asked. And it's from uh, a friend of the Watkins, Marie Brockhoff, uh, an excellent young historian. She asks, did any escaped slaves fight alongside your soldiers? And I'd like to uh, expand this question and ask, what um, African-American individuals have uh, allied with you um, in your cause against slavery? Well, once again, I have to be careful. Uh, Frederick Douglass is my friend. I have met him. I hope to meet him again. Uh, he is a stellar person, to be sure. Did uh, freed slaves? Well, there weren't that many. Freeing a slave, well, they were not in charge of their own life, even once they had been freed, because the the consequences of them being captured again was so much more than a white person in Kansas. If they fought alongside me and we were captured, they would instantly be put back into slavery if they were lucky and not murdered outright for the audacity to fight against a white man for their freedom. So no, no, they didn't, they didn't participate directly in my actions. When slaves were freed, we tried to get them to safety, to safe towns like Lawrence. And then when that became too dangerous, to get them clear out of the territory and hopefully all the way to Canada and actual freedom. And that freedom, that freedom became even more important in Canada when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed because uh, because the northern states were no longer safe. 
no longer safe place to stop. Canada became the goal of many more escaped slaves. So, so now I would have enjoyed, I would have, have welcomed my black brothers and sisters to fight alongside me. And they did in their own way, but not in open battle, at least not yet. Hmm. Interesting. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Brown, for this fascinating uh, insight and, and uh, interview about your activities. Um, so that is our program. And now, uh, I, if he'll step out of character, I'll introduce uh, Terry Altenburn. Um, there he goes. <laughs> Terry has been portraying John Brown for many years now. Uh, he's received awards for his portrayal. And uh, Terry, I'm wondering, um, would you like to describe your other work and uh, you do regarding John Brown and uh, other ways people can learn about him. Okay, sure. Uh, I, actually, I'd, I'd like to thank everybody who's, who's watching this uh, uh, and, and listening to me. Um, where to start? <laughs> uh, I've, been, I've been doing this since 2006 and uh, the activities, well, I was brought into it because of my work with the Blackjack Battlefield. Uh, uh, the, the June 2nd, 1856 uh, battle that, I, that John Brown had spoken about. I've been, I've been working with that since 2002. And uh, I've served as president of the Blackjack Battlefield Trust. And of course, we all have the Blackjack Battlefield and Nature Park, which is open dawn to dusk year round, still open dawn to dusk year round. As long as you maintain six feet, uh, you're more than welcome to, uh, to come out there and enjoy the beautiful scenery and uh, the history. We have hiking hiking trails, uh, is a walking tour brochure we have for the, uh, for the, the battlefield trail. Uh, and I seem to just not be able to avoid getting, getting involved in historical things. Uh, a few years ago, got in involved in, in trying to uh, help uh, preserve and promote the Grover Barn in Lawrence. It was the, the site of uh, in 1858, well, actually, in 18, January of 1859, John Brown, in 1858, Jan December of 1858, raided Vernon County, Missouri, and helped to liberate 11 uh, slaves there. They asked him if they wanted their freedom, and they said yes, so he escorted them into Kansas and then up through Kansas, heading for Lawrence. Uh, around Garnett, a young black, uh, one of the women uh, gave a birth to a young black boy. Uh, a free, freeborn son, and uh, who was named John, Down, John Brown Daniels in, in, in John Brown's honor. And then uh, they came up to Lawrence and spent at least one night in the barn that uh, Joel and Emily Grover had recently built on their farm, which at the time was about three miles southwest of, of Lawrence, is now well within Lawrence. Uh, and uh, it's still there, the barn. It was converted into a, a fire station in, in the early 80s for the city and was abandoned as a fire station in 2006. And, it, and, and it, since then, it hasn't had a real purpose other than just storage. So we're working on that. Uh, the Guardians of Grover Barn were formed to do that. Uh, I'm also working with uh, Friends of Oak Hill Cemetery, which is the uh, historic cemetery in Lawrence. Uh, many Quantrill raid, Quantrill's raid victims are buried there. As, 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 Court and a lot of other uh, Lawrence and Kansas citizens. Uh, Jim Lane is buried there. Uh, many other people, uh, because it's an important cemetery. Uh, so those are just a few of my activities, uh, which have been curtailed a little bit because of the uh, of the uh, well the pandemic that we're under, but. Uh, Something like what we're doing here is getting around that and uh, giving us actually opportunities that we may never have thought about doing. And now we can figure this out and be able to go into the future doing this without being required to do it, doing it because it's good to spread the word out across the country. Yeah, that's excellent, Carrie. Uh, thank you again for for uh, taking part and I'll join Terry in thanking all of our audience members for getting involved in this. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that you can 
help continue this program series by donating via the link that you'll receive in an email after this event. And uh, you'll also see a survey that you can fill out there. And with that, I would like to, again, thank everyone and say goodbye.